And then our last speaker in this session is Kate Marks from Leeds, uh, who's an ACF in histopathology, and she's going to talk about an assessment of the mutation rate of normal colorectal epithelium in patients with cancer compared to patients without. Kate, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present my work here today. And uh, my work's been in colorectal cancer, which is a very common disease. It's the third most common cancer type from both men and women in the UK. And survival is strongly dependent on the stage at which the disease is diagnosed. For those diagnosed with stage one disease, their five-year survival rate is 95%. However, those diagnosed with stage four disease, their five-year survival rate falls to just 5%. So it's clear that the key to improving outcomes is by picking up disease at an early stage. And we've already seen this with the introduction of the bowel cancer screening program. Firstly, with faecal occult blood testing that picks up mainly cancers. Then with the introduction of colonoscopy, direct visualization of the bowel, allowing for even precancerous lesions such as adenomas to be detected. But the question remains, can we improve on outcomes further? Can we pick up on abnormal changes in, um, genetic changes in the normal mucosa prior to even precancerous lesion development? When you look at the bowel, large bowel under the microscope, or as I should say on a digital slide now, you can see that the colorectal epithelium is organized into these functional units known as colonic crypts. And these sit nicely like stacked test tubes, just neatly in order. And if you were to look at this in cross section, they appear as multiple discs. Um, and this top layer here is the mucosa, and this is the functional part of the bowel. So if a mutation occurs, if a mutation occurs in a cell at the top of the crypt, in theory, it might not have much effect because cells at the top of the crypt are shed and that mutation might not be able to have any long-term effect. However, if a mutation occurs at the base of the crypt within the stem cell niche, that mutation can then, can then be, uh, can be duplicated when the cells divide and become fixed within the crypt. And we know that there's been studies that have demonstrated this showing that you start with a mutation in a stem cell, that will then replace the other stem cells within the niche and result in monoclonal conversion or fixed <coughs> mutations. Now, these alone are not enough to necessarily cause cancer, but it's how mutations become fixed within the normal bowel. So if you take this schematic here, this is someone's colorectal leopard, this is someone's mucosa when they are born, and in theory, they have no mutations. And then as a person goes through life and they're exposed to different factors and different carcinogens, mutations will occur. Some will occur at the top of the crypt and be shed and have no effect, and some will occur within a stem cell and become fixed. And over time, these mutations will be fixed in the bowel, not having much effect, but be there in the background. But not only can these mutations become fixed within the crypt, if we take this navy blue crypt here and look at it longitudinally, not only can the cells divide to replace within the crypt themselves, but actually the crypts can split and bud through a process known as crypt fission. And as a result, a mutation within a single crypt can increase its patch size and spread throughout, spread throughout the bowel. And so therefore, you get larger areas of instability. And in theory, this could potentially be where, where precancerous and early cancerous lesions are arising from. So for my research, I was interested in to better understand the background mutations that occur in normal bowel. And the question I wanted to answer was, is there and any difference in the background mutation rate from patients who have developed colorectal cancer and patients without. Now, in order to detect muta mutations, um, you need a very sensitive technique. These, are, these abnormal crypts are occurring one within a few thousand. And you can do this with sequencing. However, it can be difficult to be really certain that you've got a very accurate sensitive technique. And so therefore, to, for this project, we've taken a completely new approach by staining with X-linked proteins. This is because there's only one copy expressed so if a random mutation has occurred, you will no longer get expression within that crypt. So to demonstrate what I mean, this is um, some normal colorectal mucosa with all the crypts neatly around. They're all morphologically normal. And they've been stained with the protein monoamine oxidase A, which lives on the X chromosome. And you can clearly see that we have found a fixed mutation that's no longer expressing MAOA due to a mutation. And you can use this to, un to better understand the background mutation rate of normal bowel. So this was the technique that I used to look for nine patients with cancer and six patients without. And I looked at multiple sections of their bowel. So we were looking at tens of thousands of crypts to look at these mutations. So the first thing that I wanted to check was, whether, was to confirm that mutation rate increases with age. It has been reported before, and it's what we would expect to see. And it was indeed what we saw. So at the bottom of this graph here, we have age 
on the x-axis and the mutation rate on the y-axis with mutations per 10,000 CRIPS. And you can clearly see a positive correlation for all the samples and also the two separate groups, NNN standing for non-neoplastic normal and CAN standing for cancer-associated normal. Furthermore, when we looked at the two groups, so the, group, the patients with cancer and those without, we could see there was no significant difference in the average age of the two groups. However, there was a significant difference in the background mutation rate. So one in 2,642 groups versus one in 6,737. Or if you want to express this as per 10,000 crips, it's 5.5 versus 2.2. So it's about two and a half fold times higher in patients with cancer, despite the small, relatively small sample size, although we were sampling a very large number of crips. And this is just to show you the distribution of the data. You can cl clearly see there is a difference even with these small numbers of patients. So I concluded from this study that we can detect mutations by using clonal markers, and we have a very sensitive te technique for detecting mutations. Mutation rate does in indeed increase with age, and the background mutation rate for patients with cancer appears to be significantly higher than those patients without. Where I want to take this further is that for this initial study, I was manually um, searching for mutations and checking them and working out the, background, the total number of, of um, total number of CRIPS. We've now, with our collaborators, have um, a deep learning algorithm that can look at the digital images, automatically detect the CRIPS, and also create heat maps. So this here is a heat map of this slide. And you can see where the staining's not worked well at the edge. You often get this edge effect with immunohistochemistry. You can see that it's creating a darker part on the heat map. And you can use this to actually pick out where the mutations might be. And it's a much more accurate and quicker way of picking up these mutations. What else I want to do is this was our initial pilot study. I'm currently in the process of collecting a much larger cohort. Um, we're looking to, to collect 200 cancers and 100 match normals. And as well as just testing that background mucosa, I want to learn something about the actual distribution of those mutations. So I'm sampling as a strip from normal, normal mucosa that's adjacent to the tumor all the way out to see, is it random how these mutations are occurring, or are they clustered around where the tumor develops? We can confirm this. And then finally as well, this has just been one measure by looking at just neat mutation rate, but actually you can do much more complex crypt dynamics by looking at the number of partial mutations. So this is MEOA where those mutated cells have not completely replaced the crypt. And you can look at the proportion of partials to, to total fixed mutations to learn something more about the crypt dynamics. So finally, I'd just like to end by thanking my supervisors and collaborators at Oxford and Cambridge. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Hi. Um, well done for your presentation. Um, I just have two quick questions. Um, were your samples taken from surgical kind of resections, or were they taken from colonoscopies, for example? Uh, yes, so they were, they were all resection specimens, and this technique only works really with resection specimens because biopsies, you just don't sample enough CRIPS. You need tens of thousands to pick up these events, so you have to have multiple sections of mucosa from resection specimens. Okay, and the normals, were they from, what resection did the normals have? Uh, yes, so they were mainly from either um, volvulus, for patients with volvulus, or trauma patients. Um, but at the moment, I'm also looking to see whether we could potentially get bowel from patients with sarcomas or other cancers where bowel has been incidentally removed as well, because it is very it is difficult to get your hands on resection specimens for normal bowel. Yeah. And coming on to my second question, so after your, you find your results and how these mutations occur, how do you think we can integrate this in like clinical practice? For example, if you identify certain mutations, do you think patients will be willing to have, I mean, it's a suggestion that patients will have regular colonoscopy, sym symptomless patients. Will they just undergo colonoscopy to see if they have these mutations? Or how will, so how do you think? Quite. So yeah, this, is, this is part of a much bigger project where we're also make, looking at the microbiome. So we are actually collecting microbiome data for all these patients. But in order to show any sort of association, we need big numbers. So we're trying to see whether um, the mutation rate is linked at all to the microbiome. We're also um, looking at the microbiome, how it varies throughout the bowel. So whether um, we're hoping to see whether that could potentially be what's caught. We're trying to find, understand what's causing these mutations by understanding the distribution. Are they completely random or do they cluster in little biofilms like we would expect to see with the microbiome? So we hope to use this as a tool to better understand how carcinogens are causing cancer. 
Great, thank you. Edwin. So I enjoyed that, thank you. Um, have you tried this out on other uh, known uh, colonic pre-malignancy states, so colons that come out for, say, polyposis coli or uh, UC or th other things like that? Do you get a, also a much higher background rate? Yes, yeah, so I, I do have um, one patient who's had, a colonos um, who's had a resection for FAP, and I really extensively sampled their bowel. Um, we're still doing the analysis on that one. These samples don't come up very regularly. Um, I was trying to collect a cohort of patients with Lynch syndrome, but there are difficulties with, get, um, we've had a few difficulties with um, knowing, having confirmed knowing whether they have Lynch syndrome because of um, patient confidentiality issues. This is all meant to be anonymised data, so it's difficult to find out exactly. Um, but I'm definitely trying to, that is something that we're really interested in doing, and certainly collecting patient, um, collecting specimens with FAP, we're trying to create a biobank of that so we can work on that. Any other questions? No. Do you have any idea what the mutations could be? So this is just so this is looking for mutations in MAOA. We also have another marker. We have of this other proteins that we've stained for, such as STAG2. There's a, there's a handful of proteins on the X chromosome that we can stain for. The reason this only works on the X chromosome is because there's only one copy expressed. Any other chromosome, you, don't, you can't visualize it in this way. So it's a surrogate of what that genetic instability is like at that part in the bowel. Um, we've done some work where we've actually sequenced the normal mucosa and shown that you get where you have KRAS mutations in the normal bowel, you actually get much bigger patch sizes um, so it's showing that that KRAS mutation is somehow causing, giving those cells a growth advantage and those, the, the crypt fusion is happening at a much greater rate in those areas. So this is a surrogate for what else is going on with the genetic background of the bowel. Okay, anybody else? Yes. Uh, just coming back to the, the first question, or thinking about how you might use it clinically, I mean, if you need resection samples, it's hard to imagine how you could use it as a kind of part of a screening tool on the spectrum with the FOB sticks. Yes, I mean, it might give us a better idea of how these mutations are occurring. So we're trying to collect, using this as a tool to better understand um, what that background mutation rate is like for different groups of patients. So, for example, we're collecting a cohort of patients under 50 to see if their mutation rate is significantly higher. I don't think this technique would directly have an effect on screening, but it will certainly inform. It's a, brilliant, it's a great tool to use to really understand which groups of patients might be more at risk. And if you can use this to identify patients with this bacteria are more at risk or patients with who have these potential factors are more at risk, and then we can screen that population more closely, I see it more as a tool to inform those groups rather than being directly used within screening itself. Okay, great. So, well, if there are no more questions, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. So, so just a big thank you again to all the uh, presenters this afternoon. Again, I think we've had four really excellent presentations, and it's, and it's great to see how healthy uh, academic medicine is in your hands. So thank you all very much. Thank you.